Hello, folks. I'm just giving it a second as people come in, and then we'll get started. All right. I think I'm gonna get started now. So, hello everybody. My name is Jimena Perez Vizcasillas. I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Long Island Sound Study National Estuary Program and welcome to Community Science Long Island. Um, this is the third webinar of our series this year. Um, and it's a, it's a very unique one, and I'll tell you why in a couple of minutes, but before that, just an intro into Community Science LI, in case this is your first time joining us. Um, this webinar series started last year, um, and it's intended to connect the public with um, community science and volunteer monitoring opportunities and make that connection between how volunteers getting involved in these programs can actually make a real difference in local research and conservation um, and um, environmental management um, work going on. Um, so know that this webinar is being recorded. You can find this recording along with all other webinars in the uh, ctalk.org community science website, um, which I'll put in the chat in a little bit. Um, and um, this, um, this webinar series is being hosted by the Long Island Sound Study, by SeaTuck, New York Sea Grant, the Peconic Estuary Partnership, and the South Shore Estuary Reserve. Um, joining me today are some of our partners. We have Ariel Santos from SeaTuck, uh, who is the Policy Program Coordinator. We have Sally Kellogg, the Program Implementation Specialist at the South Shore Estuary Reserve. And we have Valerie Vergona from the Peconic Estuary Partnership. Um, and we have our panelists who are all from the Long Island Sound, sorry, Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. So this is why this webinar is very unique. Um, this is the first webinar that we're hosting that is about an invasive species and it's, it's an invasive that is um, a very real issue right now. So we have uh, folks like the ones who are joining us today uh, doing you know, efforts on the field as we speak to help control the species. So um, we're excited to have you here to learn about the spotted lanternfly. Um, so the Long Island uh, Invasive Species Management Area is one of eight groups in the Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management in New York State. Uh, joining us is the program manager, Bill Jacobs. If you want to wave, Bill. <laughs> we have the Invasive Species Field Project and Outreach Coordinator, Abby Bezrotsik, um, the Invasive Species Specialist, Haley Gladsich, and the Seasonal Invasive Species Technicians, Melody Penny and Catherine Sterber. So um, if at any point in the webinar you have any questions, please feel free to drop them either in the chat or in the Q&A button below, and um, we'll get to it at the end of the webinar. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to uh, to Melody and Catherine, I believe. So over to you. Remember to Abby's yeah. going to share her screen, I think. Yeah, remember to share your sound. Uh, good. Got point. it. <laughs> yes. Click the right button at first. And the sound too. You have the sound on. All right. Uh, actually, I'm going to go first. We have our full LISMA team here tonight. I'm Bill Jacobs, the program manager for the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. With me, as Jimena said, are Abby, Haley, Melody, and Catherine. All five of us are here tonight. Our mission is to reduce the threat of invasive species. Uh, through our region of Long Island, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. We do this by coordinating and conducting invasive species management throughout the region. We work with a, a wide variety of governmental, non-governmental, and private organizations, uh, more than 70 organizations that we work with. Major funding for LISMA 
is provided by the New York State Environmental Protection Fund as administered by New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And in today's presentation, we'll have an introduction uh, on LISMA and invasive species generally, and then we'll talk more about the spotted lanternfly and how you can get involved. And at the end, we'll have time for questions and answers. So LISMA is one of the eight invasive species regions in New York State. Each region is called a PRISM or a Partnership for Invasive Species Management. The PRISMs coordinate invasive species planning and management with a variety of public and private partners in the region and throughout the state and beyond. The LISMA region covers all of Long Island and three boroughs of New York City, Staten Island, Brooklyn, and Queens. Here is a video made by Jacqueline Briggs earlier this year on Invasive Species Awareness Week. Hey, New Yorkers. Invasive Species Awareness Week is June 6th through the 12th. Have you heard of this bug, the spotted lanternfly? If you have, you might know that it's an invasive species. An invasive species is a non-native plant, animal, insect, fungus, or even bacteria that causes harm to our local ecosystems, the economy, or to human health. And we need your help to prevent their spread. Even a family road trip can bring uninvited guests like spotted lanternfly to new areas where it can cause damage to our environment. Don't give them a free ride. You can help protect New York's vineyards and orchards by checking your car and outdoor equipment for spotted lanternfly in all its life stages. Eggs, nymphs, and adults. If you spot one, remember to scrape, smush, or squish them. And you can report invasive species with the New York IMAP Invasives mobile app. During NYSAW, you can learn about invasive species straight from the experts. Learn how you can stop the spread of invasives by cleaning your gear before hiking and boating, or burning local firewood when you camp. Take the pledge to protect your favorite hiking trail, paddleway, garden, and community at ipledgetoprotect.org. And don't forget to get the whole family involved in a fun invasive species bingo game. See a full list of NYSAW events online. We hope to see you there. Hey, New York. Okay, so before we really begin, um, I just wanted to cover some vocabulary that you might hear throughout this talk. If you want to change the slide. Okay, so first we have native species, which are those that have evolved in certain regions over the course of hundreds or thousands of years. They help, help keep balance in an ecosystem as they have organisms they consume and organisms that consume them. They also provide services that keep ecosystems healthy like water filtration and shoreline stabilization. And I should mention that we rely pretty heavily on these ecosystem services too. Filtered waters keep our fish that we eat alive and stable shorelines help reduce storm impacts. And an example of a native species would be an oak tree. Then we have non-native species. These are species that have been introduced either purposely or accidentally that have a neutral or positive effect on the environment. For example, many of our crops are non-native like tomatoes and cucumbers. And then an invasive species is not a native, non-native species, but one that is disruptive to the balance of the ecosystem and does so through a number of tactics. For example, rapid spread, high reproduction, and changing the um, ecosystem to favor its own survival. So an invasive species can cause problems with the environment, economy, or human health. Um, and invasive species are capable of causing extinctions of native plants and animals, reducing biodiversity, competing with native organisms or for limited resources and altering habitats. The economic effect of an invasive species include both direct effects of a species on property values, agriculture, productivity, tourism, and other um, outdoor recreation, as well as costs associated with invasive species control and effects. Um, invasive species can negatively impact human health by infecting humans with new diseases serving as 
vectors for existing diseases or causing wounds through bites, stings, allergens, or other toxins. An example of affecting human health would be the giant hogweed, which can cause extreme burns on human skin. Hey, uh, Catherine, one second, and Melody. Abby, there's a little funny gray box on the top right of our screen. See how that, can that go? That happens every once in a while. It, it uh, now it got bigger now. I think that's like her Zoom box from sharing her screen. Yeah, yeah. now it's gone. Okay, yeah, thanks. There's one on the bottom, but it's not as bad. But there is a, there's one on the bottom now too. Yeah, well, there, yeah, perfect. Oh. It was perfect. Every time uh, I hover over it, it will come back right. up. So we just have to. All right, we're, we're doing good. It looks better though. Thank you. All right. Uh, sorry, Melody. No worries. So, when thinking about an invasive species management, it's most important to identify and understand the species that you're observing and working with before management can take place. Think about its habitat, growth patterns, and the type of environment it thrives in. It's also important to consider the impacts the species has on its surrounding ecosystems, um, how aggr aggressively it can be spread, and its abundance in the environment. In taking a step back to think about these key factors, we can then determine whether or not control is feasible on a manual, mechanical, chemical, or biological level, and whether or not the process will require more assistance from partnering entities. In this process, we also want to be thinking about how we can prevent its spread to other sites. By not spreading the seeds of an invasive plant, not moving firewood, uh, firewood and by cleaning our gear in between sites. Thanks, Melody and Catherine. So now that we know what an invasive species is, we can talk a little bit more about why this particular species, spotted lanternfly, is a problem. So in short, spotted lanternfly is an invasive insect that has spread across the Northeast over the past eight years. And this is a good example of a species that is a harm both to the economy and the environment by impacting agriculture, which we'll talk about more in a minute, as well as stressing plants in natural landscapes. But as Melody said, we wanna start with identifying and understanding the species. We want to understand what it looks like, how it spreads and what it does. So what does SLF do? Or, um, that's what we tend to call it, SLF, also known as Lycorma delicatula. So what does spotted lanternfly do? Um, well, first of all, it feeds on plants. They use their piercing sucking mouth parts to consume plant sap, which can make plants stressed. So they feed on plants from the nymph stage to adults, and they can feed on more than 70 different plant species. Although I think that range kind of narrows as they become adults. They don't feed as on as many species as they become adults. And this can be a big problem for agriculture because some of their favorite plants are grapes, orchards, hops, um, those kind of plants. They can also lay their eggs in funny places. So you might expect them to be laying their eggs on, uh, on plants because that's where they would like to be eating, but um, that's not always the case. So they prefer smooth, protected surfaces, which can include tree bark, but also tires, benches, um, you know, your patio furniture, the underside of a car, a bike, they don't get very picky uh, at a certain point. And this is important to know because it, it's one way that spotted lanternfly has been transported from its original location um, in the United States and Pennsylvania across the Northeast. And lastly on this list, it secretes honeydew. So they expel their excess sugars as a substance we call honeydew. It's kind of a shiny, sticky substance. And this can coat plant leaves as well as patios and, car, and cars causing a general nuisance, maybe in your backyard. This can also uh, welcome another organism called sooty mold, which can block photosynthesis. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second too. So all of these things, uh, the fact that it feeds on plants, lays eggs in funny places and secretes honeydew can lead to the negative experiences that we have with spotted lanternfly. Our ecosystems are also not adapted to this new plant hopper and it can multiply easily without natural predators as a consequence. Also humans have accidentally helped it spread. So let's talk a little bit more about the spread. So spotted lanternfly is a plant hopping insect, a plant hopper native to China, India, and Vietnam. And it's suspected that it was brought over on a stone bench as an egg mass. 
So um, in 2014, that was when it was first detected in Berks County in Pennsylvania. Then we're looking more about how it spread to New York. So in 2017 uh, was the first time that a dead adult was found in Delaware County, New York, the first spotted lanternfly found in the state. And since then it spread further. So in 2018, more individuals were found in five New York counties. And in 2020, we found our first one locally in Staten Island. Um, and that brings us to today where spotted lanternfly populations have been confirmed in Nassau and Suffolk counties. And um, a lot of it is also in New York City. So just to look a little bit more at the map, um, you can see Pennsylvania is quite filled in with its uh, presence of this insect as well as uh, thoroughly in New Jersey. Actually, I was in uh, New Jersey last weekend and I saw one there and it ruined my day, <laughs> but that's how um, widespread it is. And we also have populations here on Long Island, as well as I think they're getting some new populations farther south. You can see in North Carolina is another front of the invasion. So in managing a species, we really need to understand its extent. That's part of the reason why we're having this webinar, but we want to talk to you about um, mapping it, which Haley will talk about more. And especially for this insect that is spreading relatively quickly, we need all the help that we can get. Over to you, Bill. Okay, thank you, Abby. Let's look at the life cycle of the spotted lanternfly. We'll start on the top right of this uh, graphic here. The, the first spotted lanternflies start to emerge sometime in uh, several weeks over the course of May through June. And then there are three more nymphal stages that progress through the summer. Now, at this point, the, the uh, first three instars, they like herbaceous plants. They're not too picky. They don't move around a lot. They look around at what's close to them, and if they think it tastes good, they'll uh, they'll suck on it. So it could be any kind of pretty much any herbaceous plant. Those first through first three instar stages. Then uh, around the end of July and beginning of August, and about now, we start to see the adults. And during the first three instar states, the spotted lanternfly. Uh, still an opportunistic feeder, but now it feeds on woody plants. This, this happens around the fourth end star, if I back up one end star. They start to feed on woody plants at that fourth end star, the red, black, and white one there, uh, July and September. Then the uh, adults start to fly July, August, about now September. And they feed on woody plants, trees, and also woody vines like grapevines. And as adults, their behaviors emerge. They're flying now. They don't fly very far, but they do fly. So we see them flying about now, August and September. And toward the end of September through December is when they lay their eggs. So they'll lay eggs up until the first hard frost in December. They, let's see, the spotted lanternfly females lay eggs in rows and they cover their eggs with a protective substance. The substance is white and glossy at first, but it fades over time, turns a gray brown when it's dried. And it's about, the egg mass is about one and a, one and a half inches long. Looks similar to a smudge of clay. Each egg mass contains about 40 eggs and females can lay two egg masses of 40 eggs each. And if you see one of these in those little holes throughout the rows there, that's an egg mass where the nymphs have already emerged. I think we skipped one. Oh no, we got that one, yeah. So I just going back to that last one, they can lay egg masses anywhere on trees, on uh, vehicles, on furniture, just about anywhere. They're not that particular where they lay their eggs. Sometimes on trees, the eggs are very high up in the canopy of the tree, which makes control difficult. All right, next slide. So this is the tree of heaven. This is their favorite tree. It's not the only tree they'll eat. They also like maples, 
uh, black walnut, and there's several other trees that they like. But this is their absolute favorite. This is an invasive tree. It's a fast growing tree. The leaflets grow in pairs along the stalk. It looks very similar to black walnut or even, uh, well, it looks similar to black walnut from a distance. But if you look close, you see on the upper right, the photograph there, there's a tooth. So each leaf along that uh, central stalk has a tooth at the base of it. So if you see that, it's not a black walnut, it's a tree of heaven. That's, and there's also a gland there beneath each tooth. I usually don't notice the gland, but I do notice the, the tooth. That's a very invasive tree that forms dense stands that crowd out other native trees and other native species. And people tell me it smells like rancid peanut butter. I've never noticed that, but people tell me that. So it's a stinky tree. And the mold that it produces, the sooty mold, it feeds ants and bees and other creatures. So the sooty mold drops down and infects the leaves of uh, plants below the tree of heaven, which is a problem. It, it can damage trees in the understory by blocking sunlight. The sooty mold gets so thick that it can block sunlight and, and block photosynthesis of plants below the tree. And it attracts other insects that can also stress the tree over time. Thanks, Bill. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the impacts to agriculture. Um, for starters, spotted lanternfly can lead to crop loss, especially on vineyards and orchards. Or orchards. Um, this happens as the spotted lanternfly um, feeds on the plant and it reduces the number or size of grape clusters that can be on the plant, also lowering its cold hardiness, so generally stress towards these crops. Um, it also results in a high cost. For example, in 2017, spotted lanternfly cost Pennsylvania agriculture uh, $42.6 million statewide, and they could also uh, lead to job loss as crops are lost and um, there's an economic decline and maybe the vineyard region uh, of that area, that could be a consequence. And lastly, agritourism can be impacted. So vineyard, orchard, and brewery experiences may be reduced as spotted lantern play, damage plants, and also create a nuisance for visitors. Over to you, Bill. Oh. Thank you. So some of the damage, wilting, yellowing, and dead branches on trees, uh, weeping wounds, like we said already, that attract bees, ants, and wasps, and other insects. For tree nurseries, this can be a huge problem as it reduces tree growth and produces unhealthy trees. Again, these are messy. They produce honeydew and sooty mold. Honeydew is the waste that they secrete, and they secrete a lot of it. Uh, which, and as I mentioned before, it blocks photosynthesis to understory trees. It also damages decks and deck furniture and backyards. So it's a pretty messy insect. As far as forests go, it's not known yet to kill established trees. Uh, if their trees are stressed, if they have another stress, say from a beech leaf disease or some other kind of a stress, then you're adding another stress on top of a stress, and that could start to kill some established trees. Thanks, and I wanted to spotlight grapes, since that's a species that will be heavily impacted by spotted lanternfly, to give a window into the biology of what's really happening there when spotted lanternfly feeds on it. So heavy feeding from spotted lanternfly can alter the movement of nutrients in the plant. Um, that means less carbohydrates are getting to the roots for winter storage, which means there are fewer nutrients the following spring. And also less nutrients are found in the leaves. So basically it's altering the nutrient dynamics and distribution, which will stress the plants. That spooty mold accumulation, as Bill said, can block photosynthesis on the leaves, uh, especially a spotted lantern fly or maybe higher up in the canopy. It doesn't attack the fruit itself or cause any flavor issues that are known yet, 
But interesting, and also interestingly, most of this invasion happens on the vineyard edges. That makes sense if you think that spotted lanternfly might be on those um, the hedgerows that are bordering a vineyard. They might be able to build up their populations there, especially if a tree of heaven is present, and then they can move in from there. So that's um, something interesting to know. So that means that scouting for spotted lanternfly is most important, especially um, on vineyards, but also throughout our communities to be able to know where it is so we can keep everybody prepared for this insect as it's moving across. And um, also managing tree of heaven and hedgerows can be very useful. Uh. Thanks, Abby um, and Bill. That was really informative. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about how you all can get involved. My slides might be lagging, so. <laughs> oh. Mostly squishing them. <laughs> We're going to talk a lot about squishing bugs. <laughs> um, so first of all, it takes a team. Um, with new species really sweeping across a broad area, a lot of different organizations have to get involved. Lisma is working to educate the public about this pest and help understand its distribution, while other organizations like the New York State Department of Ag and Markets are working on controlling the species on the ground. And still others like Cornell Cooperative Extension and the New York State IPM are keeping former farmers in, informed on um, all sorts of new research that's coming out of universities like Penn State and Cornell University. Um, universities that are actively doing really cutting edge research on the best sustainable, sustainable control methods for uh, this invasive species. Um, all sorts of things like, um, you know, things from chemical treatments as well as biocontrol options. So, you know, it's really great to stay um, informed on these new efforts as they become available. Um, but beyond these really larger entities, we also rely heavily on other folks on the ground to be reporting spotted lanternfly especially since those are the people who are going to be most directly impacted by this invasive pest. Um, people such as vineyard operators and uh, orchard growers, private landscaping companies, and folks such as yourselves are really important to noticing spotted lanternfly um, while you're in your day-to-day -day job or walk or hike. Um, and because of that, we're gonna talk a little more about specifically what you can do to help slow the spread of spotted lanternfly and really mitigate its impacts. So what you can do, so the first thing, if you see a spotted lanternfly insect, um, don't panic. Um, like Abby said, while spotted lanternfly can stress plants, it's not really known to kill plants, most plants outright. Um, it's really that accumulation of plant stressors by a lot of spotted lanternflies that might end up being harmful to a plant um, in a backyard or in your community. Um, so from there, remember not to spread the spotted lanternflies. When moving across Long Island, please remember to check your vehicle for spotted lanternfly adults, egg masses, or um, nymphs. Um, if you're driving from outside the island um, or like, you know, to other places like uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and then coming back onto Long Island, definitely make sure to check your, your car wheel wells and other parts of your car before coming back on the island if you're moving through New York City as well. Um, and if you're moving from pretty much anywhere on Western Long Island out east, we really don't want the spotted lanternflies moving out there. So be especially sure to just check your cars really at this point, wherever you're going. Um, if you can, you can use iNaturalist or iMap Invasives um, to be mapping occurrences of spotted lanternflies. Um, and that helps to alert public um, officials, land managers, and researchers to really better understand the current distribution of spotted lanternfly on the island. Um, so you can do this by taking a photo and then submitting it to a mapping platform, which will give you the uh, information at the end for those. And then once you do that, you can do the maybe fun and maybe more difficult part for some people, um, which is squishing the insect. Um, so if you see adults or larvae, nymphs, you can um, you can just go ahead and squish them. Um, and then if you see an egg mass on a tree or some other surface, you can scrape them off using a um, credit card um, or some other you know blunt edge surface um, and putting it into a plastic bag with alcohol solution or throwing it and throwing it in the trash or um, what you can do is actually you could squish those egg masses as well. I know this isn't really pretty to talk about, but you can squish the egg masses until it, they are sufficiently squished. You can't just scrape the egg masses off the trees onto the ground um, or else they can still actually, um, you know, turn into larvae and adults. So 
it's really important to um, to really properly dispose of the egg masses once you found them. Let's go to the next slide. So one of the ways you can stay consistently involved with this effort is by adopting a square. So the New York, New York State IMAP Invasives and New York State Department of Ag and Markets, as well as the help of LISMA staff, such as myself, have developed several hundred three square mile uh, monitoring squares all across Long Island. The idea is that using IMAP Invasives, um, which is a free to use online um, public mapping platform, community members such as yourself can claim grid squares um, on public land and help to scout for spotted lanternfly. While it's important to map spotted lanternfly wherever you might see it, um, you can also be mapping spotted lanternfly in very specific places, which sort of helps us to collect data um, all across Long Island to create a baseline of where spotted lanternfly is and isn't. Um, this way, when we do get a, you know, a hit of spotted lanternfly somewhere, we can go back and see maybe for a few years there were not detected records in a specific location, and it can help us really better understand how long an invasion um, and infestation might be established. Um, so to do this, we're asking community members such as yourself to claim a grid square um, that you'll promise to monitor two to three times a year. Um, and on this map, you can see all sorts of different colors of grid squares. There's um, purple ones that have tree of heaven that are known to be present, blue ones that are publicly accessible land, um, mostly state and county parks. There's orange squares um, where uh, near, uh, where, oh, those, the orange squares are ones that Lisma has recommended. Um, sorry, yeah, specifically, um, because they're in other parks that maybe Ag and Markets and IMAP invasives didn't realize are publicly accessible. Um, and then the more dark orange ones are priority focus areas by New York State Ag and Markets. And lastly, the, greens, the green, uh, green, the gray squares are ones that have already been claimed. Um, and we can put this link in the chat uh, so that you can uh, claim a square if you'd like to do so. And I could talk a little bit more about the process of claiming a square. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, so once you find a square that you'd like, I think that this was over West Hills, which is not too far from where I live. It's a park that I frequent often. Um, I can find that square and click on it. And once I click on it, that little black pop-up box comes up and you have that little blue link that says, claim this grid square. Um, and then once you click that button, it'll bring you to the New York Natural Heritage Program um, webpage for claiming a grid square. And all you need to do is put in your IMAP Invasives ID so if you don't yet have um, an IMAP Invasives account, you can do so at imapinvasives.org. Um, really quick to make an account, you just you know, use your uh, email, your name, um, and you can use it online or you can download it um, on your mobile device. Um, it's free, again, free to use and pretty, pretty easy to use as well. Um, so once you uh, make an account, you just use your IMAP uh, person ID your email address, your first and last name, and that's it. You've claimed your grid square, and that's your grid square for the whole next year. Um, and once you've claimed your square, you are all ready to monitor. So if you want to go to the next page, we can talk a little bit more about what you do when you're monitoring your grid square. So you have your grid square, you're ready to get out there, but just before you get out there, uh, the first thing you want to do is maybe Think about a few places, maybe this is a park you're really familiar with or a shopping center. Some of them are actually over shopping centers because there's lots of smooth surfaces and shopping centers like poles, um, like parking, those little parking block things. Um, so think about places that it might be that spotted lantern fly might like to land on and lay their eggs, places where there might be tree of heaven that you know about, um, parking lots at the beginning of trails, um, anything like that. And think about places that are maybe more easily accessible to you. Maybe, you know, there's a road running down the middle of your square. So you might not want to go and monitor for spotted lantern fly in the middle of a road. Um, so think about those three places that you might want to travel to first. Um, and once you have that in mind, you can go to the, your grid square. So, you know, head out to your grid square, have your phone all ready with IMAP invasives. Um, and once you get to your first point, just take about 10 to 15 minutes and look around, see if you can, uh, see any egg masses on a smooth surface if it's the time of the year that egg masses might be about. Um, look on Tree of Heaven or any other smooth bark tree, especially looking around like um, kind of like the undersides of bark, if like barks maybe slightly flipped up or maybe where the branches form sort of like an elbow. Um, 
spotted lanternfly really like to lay their eggs in there. You can also just be looking around for the nymphs or the adults. Um, and once you do that, you can, if you find a spotted lanternfly, you want to make a presence record. Um, there's two options when you when you're going to make a record. It's a, either a presence record or an out detected record. Obviously, if you see one, make a presence record, take a photo, um, a really nice clear photo of whatever the life stage of the spotted lanternfly that you see is. You can always make other comments in the app saying, you know, what it was on. Um, maybe if you saw a lot of others nearby, um, maybe potential other vectors of spread like it's in a parking lot um those are great things to note in the app and if you don't see any spotted lantern fly great put in a not detected record you know you do this pretty much the same thing you don't need to take a photo you could just say not detected and then you go to your two other spots and then once you've done that you're pretty much set this can become a really nice part of maybe a hike routine that you like to do um maybe every couple of months if it's a place you like to frequent um, or otherwise, it's maybe a fun way for you to get outside um, and help us monitor. And then from there, just you know, return to the site two to three times a year um, in this year. So you know, if you sign up now in August, um, maybe you want to head back later on in September, and maybe it would be great if you could head out there maybe again in October or November. So yeah, that's pretty much it with um, how to adopt a grid square and monitor. And I'm just going to give you a few more ways for you to report spotted lanternfly if you do see it anywhere. Um, if you live outside of New York City, you can contact the spotted lanternfly responders from the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets through this link. And Pimenda is going to put it in the chat. Um, if you maybe don't feel comfortable using um, the form, it, maybe it's confusing, um, you can, of course, just email the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. Um, with this email. Um, again, these two options are if you're living outside of New York City. New York City is pretty heavily um, inundated with spotted lanternfly right now. So they're really focusing on, um, you know, these reports from further out in Long Island at the moment. Um, and if you're using, you know, the email or the form, some things you're going to want to include are a photo of the insect that you found, the pest, the, uh, the life stage that the pest is in. Um, you're going to want to include an address or the coordinates where you found it. And again, you might want to make a note of like how much you saw. If you saw one, if you saw a bunch, you know, um, those are really helpful um, things to note. And then if you live uh, in New York City or on Long Island or anywhere else, you can use, again, IMAP Invasives, uh, the mobile app or the online platform, as well as iNaturalist, which is um, a more commonly used public mapping app that um, LISMA, as well as New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, the New York State DEC, um, they, we all receive notifications when um, spotted lanternfly is, uh, you know, uploaded, um, an observation of spotted lanternfly is uploaded on the app. On, uh, so yeah, all many different ways. It's really, you know, user's choice um, for reporting spotted lanternfly. And I believe that is all I have. Um, so if you have any questions, you can go ahead and enter them in the chat. Um, Otherwise, I believe that is all. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, if you, again, our in contact information is here if you'd like to shoot us any emails. Um, and as well, you know, thanks to everyone on the call tonight from um, uh, the Conic Estuary Partnership, Long Island Sound Study, um, and uh, others. I know I'm forgetting some people in here. Um, and of course, thanks to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and um, Agriculture and Markets for all the work that they're doing. Um, on this um, test. Thank you so much. This was wonderful, guys. Um, all right, so as Haley said, now is the time for questions. Um, I encourage you to, if you have any questions at all on the spotted lanternfly, on how to get involved in monitoring, um, on the apps mentioned, um, you can drop them in the chat, you can drop them in the Q&A, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, I do see a hand up from Marissa Nelson. I don't know if that's an oops hand. It's been up for a while. So um, Marissa, let me know if you'd like me to unmute you or if you'd like to leave a question in the chat. Um, so I do have a question and I, 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 I'm sorry if I missed it, but um, you said um, you know, if, if people are going out to monitor um, two to three times per year, when when during the year is the best time to monitor? And um, I think you covered the seasons of when, you know, when when they're expecting to see the eggs and when the adults. So 
Um, would you mind covering that again? I'm, I'm sorry. I can take that one. I think when the adults are out is probably the easiest time to see them, which would be now. So late August, September, October, good time to look for them. You have up until the first hard frost sometime in December, they'll go all the way. So any time now, and if, if you can't, for some reason, or don't want to use the grid square system, you can just wherever you are, you can use iNaturalist on your phone. And uh, if you do see one, it's good to record it. iNaturalist is a free app that anyone can download to their cell phone. There's a desktop version also, but you just have to take a picture of it before you squish it and it'll uh, go right into the record at, at iNaturalist. Right. Um, and I think an iNaturalist can be used even if you're not 100% sure what you saw. Uh, the app should help identify yep. what, right, what it is. Yes, you can use it to identify any kind of a plant or animal or a person even. And uh, it helps if you don't know what it is, there's a whole community out there. The app itself has an intelligence to it. So it will help you identify what it is. And if they still don't know what it is, there is a community out there that will look at it and help you identify anything you see. That's great. Yeah, I love iNaturalist. I do um, so, <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> so I do have, uh, we do have a comment in the chat um, from Byron Young. He says it is, it is probably a bit late, but I observed uh, the spotted lantern fly in Rocky Point about three weeks ago near Broadway and Route 25A. The insect appeared to be dead in the parking lot of Tilda's Bakery. So there's a there's an FYI. Is it um, could he go? Well, I guess he doesn't have a picture, but is there a way for him to report that even if it was three weeks ago? Well, he just did, but it, it's. Yeah, it's hard that way. I'm not sure if there's a if that can still be reported. I mean, it, it couldn't hurt. You could use that email address to the Department of Agriculture. It wouldn't hurt to email it and say you saw one uh, in Rocky Point. So it's some somewhat useful information. I'm not too far from uh, Rocky Point. It could have traveled in a vehicle. And I've heard of stories where it turns up dead in parking lots. So I always wonder was it somehow attached to the underside of a car or a truck or something? Mm. But yeah, that's the email address. You, you could shoot them an email. I would say that far west is probably good to always report a de dead or alive. So um, you might want to send in that email and then also note that it was dead. Um, but yeah. it would be helpful for you know folks that are keeping an eye out that way to check in. All right, thank you. Any other questions from um, our um, attendees or even um, some of the partners who are here today? Anybody have any other questions? Byron says, we'll do. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Byron. All right. Well, if there are no no other questions, you know, well, I'll give you back fifteen minutes to your to your evening, and and Bill, you can go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you all so much for joining. Um, our next um, community science webinar will be on September nineteenth. It'll be on eelgrass, um, really interesting species and important species. So, if you're interested to learn more, you can register at. Uh, the ctalk.org community science website, um, which I'll put on the chat now. Here you go. And, uh, oh. There was oh, a question actually, that came up. Yeah, we do have a question. What's the best way to destroy the eggs? That's a good question. I think Haley covered some of that. You can scrape them off or squish the egg mass, it's small, about an inch and a half, squish it. But here's the here's the problem, 90% or so of the egg masses are up in the canopy. So even if we get the ones down low, we, we, it's impossible really to reach the high ones, but it wouldn't hurt if you see one. You're really good at climbing trees. 
highly recommend. <laughs> there's, to uh, them off. there's oils and pesticides that have been tested on egg masses. Spray them. Doesn't work very well. Egg masses and eggs have kind of natural protections. They don't absorb a lot of things that you put on them. So that hasn't been very effective. Any kind of uh, oils or uh, spraying the egg masses is not that effective. Probably more effective to squish them if you see them. Is is putting them in alcohol any more effective than squishing? Like, are they are they hard <laughs> eggs or? You can put them in an alcohol solution in a bag for sure, and just make sure you toss that bag out. Um, I think that's the the best way to do it. Some right. people might not like squishing. Maybe it's just, it's just an alternative method. Okay. And All other right. while we're on the subject of controlling them, this there's contact sprays, contact pesticides that can be sprayed onto the the. Uh, Spotted lantern fly, they're kind of wimpy creatures. They're not very strong or hardy, but uh, the contact sprays do work, but it's so temporary. It's like a day or two. And then you get, you contact pesticide with the spotted lantern fly, and then two days later, new spotted lantern flies come in. So that's not recommended. So directly spraying all the spotted lantern flies in the, in the trees. It, it's too short of a, of uh, a time where it might work and you, plus you just spread pesticide all over the place and a final one there are some systemic herbis uh, chemicals insecticides there's a couple that do work if a tree is treated at the at the roots or the the bark the lower bark they can be somewhat effective but then again you have to be very careful about uh, applying pesticides to trees after blooming or any kind of plants after blooming. If you apply insecticides or pesticides to plants before they bloom, you can you risk killing all the pollinators, the bees and the butterflies and everything else. So yes, there are some systemic herbicides, but these these insects are so widespread, they're not going to have a huge effect. As it stands now, there's no way to eradicate spotted lanternflies, but we have researchers working on it. And there's also no way to prevent them from entering any specific property at this point. But again, we're gathering information about where they move and how they move and how fast they move and things like that. So hopefully we will have a treatment right. soon. Right. Well, and, and the more people kind of know how to identify and know that that has to be squished, then, then the more helpful that'll be, I'm thinking. Yeah. All right. Um, so any other questions? I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you again to our wonderful panelists for participating in Community Science LA. Good luck with this. Um, and thank you for all this work that you're doing. Um, thank you to you for attending and to the partners. Um, for, for making a CSLA possible. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, Jimena. Bye, everybody. Bye.